So happy new year everybody, or best wishes for the new year. And I got some really beautiful questions. I will uh, share them with everybody on the chat. So these are the questions I got. And actually I want to start with the second question. Because the second question also answers several things about the first question. So I'll we'll post it again. Okay, um, so the question, I uh, will read it out loud, is can it be seen energetically that people are divided into different castes? Um, how is it seen energetically? Is this seen in the level of a chakra? And is it right to say that each caste possesses different ethical values, which are not characteristics of other castes? So Brahmins are to serve the collective, Kshatriyas are brave, proud, have responsibility for the weaker, Vaishyas have honesty and generosity, Sudras have humility, and are nations inclined to represent a particular caste? Um, this is a very, very beautiful question because it's really about also the, uh, the essence of what we are trying to do in our spiritual development. Um, so let me start with the easy part. Uh, can it be seen energetically? Yes, it can be seen energetically to what caste a person belongs. And um, it's a little bit of a, of a double thing. So there are various uh, ways or various methods to uh, see what, uh, what is the nature of a person. Um, the first thing uh, uh, which is notable is basically the level of vibration a person has. Um, and yeah, we're again, as usual, talking about the light cosmos. So in the light cosmos, the uh, quality uh, is basically determined by the purity of the energy. So if your energy is very pure, very harmonious, uh, that indicates a relatively higher caste or a higher position within a caste than a person whose energy is more polluted, more confused, less harmonious. So this gives a very general indication. But um, if you look only at the, the quality of the energy, you can be confused. Because, for instance, a person who is a very bad Brahmin might have a lesser quality of energy than a person who is a very good Sudra. So you see that while in general, like on an average, the Brahmins would have a better quality of energy uh, and the Kshatriya slightly less, Vaishya uh, slightly less, Sudra also less, um, that if you look at the particular person this won't hold true. Because besides the quality of the energy, there are other much more important uh, qualities uh, which really uh, make a person a member of a certain caste. And I've made a little, um, a little system, I'll just hold it up to the camera here, so people can see it in the lesson, and I will read it to you now. Um, so there are several qualities which are visible. Um, and the first quality I want to talk about is basically the morality. Um, uh, we human beings actually have two moral centers and they are located uh, in the crown chakra and in the throat chakra. And um, these um, uh, moral centers, they regulate our behavior and they regulate our impulses. Um, if we look at the throat chakra, this is basically the morality which we are taught, which we learn from our society, our parents, the books we read. Uh, so we are told certain things are good, certain things are bad, and what is the proper type of behavior. And um, also the uh, spirit can have a morality, 
and this is represented more in the crown chakra and the huge a little bit more in the crown chakra that we see a person's um, um, like more spiritual morality they're more natural inborn uh, moral behavior and uh, the way it works is basically as a, a filter a kind of a stopgap because in our uh, through our crown chakra we receive influences so different gods different spirits different egregores um, all kinds of different uh, beings can inspire us can give us certain emotions certain thoughts certain visions and uh, in a way try to inspire us or use us as a as a tool uh, to work for them and basically what our morality uh, filter does it basically it yeah it filters it says okay certain impulses i will be open to other impulses i will not be open to and um, any filter has a breaking point just like any person has a breaking point so you cannot say that gosh this person has a very strong morality so they will only do good things because when they're hungry or when they're uh, desperate they might do things which are immoral but they will know that that is immoral so there will be a higher threshold for them to fall into that type of behavior uh, another thing is also that their morality might be very different from your own morality so what they would, would filter out as good or evil according to their spirit might be very different from what you would consider good or evil so even this structure of morality is not an absolute there is no absolute right or wrong uh, but at least a person has a concept a very strong concept of right and wrong and this uh, very strong moral structure which is part of the crown chakra uh, is basically what distinguishes the two yeah, higher castes from the two lower castes so with people who have uh, a brahmin energetic body or etc energetic body they will have this structure very strongly present so they will very strongly identify uh, with an ideal uh, with their idea of perfection their idea of, of good and will try to serve that ideal and not try to um, to go against it so this is a very big difference you can see between uh, Brahmana and uh, Kshatriya caste people and Vaishya and Sudra caste people and how it is uh, visible is basically the um, uh, moral structure is like a little bit like laws like a code like a programming you put inside your own chakra and your own chakra loses a part of its flexibility so it's a little bit like your uh, chakra has a flow of energy which is flowing naturally into your head and it is a little bit like there's um, a kind of a inverted pyramidical structure which is like a stopgap which in a way blocks certain impulses and depending on um, the location of that structure how strong it is how weak it is how firm it is if it blocks a lot or if it blocks a little you can tell a little bit about the moral structure of the person you're uh, uh, you're uh, watching energetically um, and roughly what we uh, see is also that um, this moral structure also says something about the person's um, spiritual maturity um, because we need rules we need laws in a way to help us along our path so often you find that people who are very much in the beginning of the path they need a lot of rules and the rules need to be very strict because there is very little understanding there is very little ability to to deal um, with problems and with exceptions so the the path is relatively narrow so the moral structure tends to be relatively big and very strong very rigid uh, in nature and as the person progresses uh, there will be more and more understanding and the person will be able to handle more and more things themselves instead of having to rely on outside guidance or predetermined guidance which is in a way uh, what we do by swearing an oath or making a promise 
we also generate a moral structure by, for instance, uh, swearing something. Um, and um, as we progress, then in a way we naturally behave in the correct way because we have more and more understanding of the ideal we serve or the gods or the higher beings we serve. Uh, so this structure tends to start to uh, become a little bit more refined. Um, so in the end the structure is not so much, um, you could say, it, it, it's not necessarily much more flexible, but it will be a much more intricate structure. And uh, by its intricacy it also becomes harder to see and a person's behavior might not be so clearly moral because it is much more precise with a lot more exceptions uh, in it. But the size of the moral structure and the presence of the moral structure really indicate whether the person, um, if it is very strongly present, then the person probably has very strong uh, brahmana or ksatriya tendencies. So the second quality, I will hold it up to the camera for another moment, is basically the sensitivity. Um, sensitivity is also a quality which can be observed in actually uh, all the chakras but also the, the aura and the energy body in general. Um, so the main uh, quality which generates sensitivity is basically the heart chakra. And having a very large, very open heart chakra and very little blockages in the heart chakra, they generate a very high degree of sensitivity. And um, the sensitivity is basically the hallmark of a person who is either of uh, the Brahmana caste or of the Vaishya caste. So for the, uh, the Brahmana caste, it is very much a, um, a sensitivity to the, the, the more subtle impulses, the higher energies, the inspiration they get from the higher worlds, um, because it is the, the purpose of, of a Brahmin to be uh, on the one hand a priest or a priestess, so to receive the direct guidance, but also in a lesser degree to be an innovator, somebody who brings new impulses to the world, to be an artist. Um, so these are slightly lower vibrations, they're more astral in nature or collective in nature, but still they're relatively high vibrations. So the sensitivity to these high vibrations is in a way what uh, distinguishes a Brahmana from all other castes. And if you, if you look at the Vaisha, the Vaisha is very sensitive to more human vibrations, more emotional vibrations, more uh, verbal vibrations. Uh, so Vaishas tend also to have a very strong uh, sensitivity and also capability in art. Uh, but usually it is more of a, um, a lower degree of vibration, a more simple vibration, if you will. So Vaishas are by nature very good uh, communicators. Uh, they are very good on a, on a social level. In, uh, in working with other people, in uniting people, in getting people to, um, to work together in a way. Uh, this also makes them very good as, uh, as artists and especially as performers. Because a, a Brahman might have some inspiration, but he cannot easily translate this high ideal he has into something which is yeah, normal for other humans, which they can feel, which they can understand. And this is basically what a Vaisha excels in. He's very much a people's person, or she is very much a people's person. Um, so the, uh, the flexibility or the sensitivity of the person is in a way shown by the flexibility of the energy body. How much does it respond to another uh, energy which makes contact with it? And um, you see in a way that with the persons of a, a Brahmin nature, of a Vaishya nature, they uh, amplify actually the impulses they receive. So an impulse might not be very strong, but they pick it up and they make it larger in the con so that to their consciousness it becomes bigger. So the, uh, also the experience of a person with a Brahmin nature or a Vaishya nature is that um, 
often the things they feel or they pick up from other people, they're larger than they are in reality. So a person might be a little bit sad and they will feel like, oh, you have such pain in your heart. I feel it and I feel for you. So it tends to be a little bit amplified. So it is good if you have a Brahman nature or Vaisha nature that you realize that you have a sensitivity but also um, the things you feel are not always felt as strongly by the person who is actually experiencing uh, the emotion. Um, but this also makes that uh, the other person or the other impulse to be larger than life in the experience of a Brahmin or, uh, or a Vaishya. So for a Vaishya, when they are with somebody else, this other person is really the center of their universe. They become more important than all other things. And it's the same for a Brahman who is inspired by something. This inspiration is larger than all other things. So they forget to eat, they forget to work, they are in a way in the thrall of what they're feeling. And um, so this is kind of a... Um, it can be a very unsettling thing. Uh, to, to have this Brahman nature or this Vaishya nature uh, because it has such a strong influence on them. And this is often how you uh, also recognize a little bit the Brahman or the Vaishya that they um, are in a way always uh, swept along a little bit by rivers of energy which are around them so they're very sensitive to their environment. So for a person of Vaishya or Brahmin nature, it's very important where they live, um, who they are with in terms of people. Um, not so much what they do, but the quality of the energy is, um, is very much paramount, uh, of paramount importance for them to be able to, to function well, uh, because they cannot easily um, rid themselves of it. And as a Brahmin or a Vaishya, uh, matures. They learn more and more techniques to stabilize themselves, to interpret all these impulses they are getting, but they cannot change the nature of their energy body, which has a very strong tendency to uh, to react. So the third thing, and you will notice it is actually um, in counterpoint to the sensitivity is the willpower. Um, and the reason for this is that willpower is uh, actually visible by a completely opposite um, of sensitivity. Um, so sensitivity is basically that you allow the things outside of you to influence you, to shape you, to form you into uh, something. And willpower is really the opposite. It is that you have an internal power which gives you a shape, which gives you a form, which creates you. So either you are a creation of the higher impulses, in the case of a, of a Brahman, or you're the creation of your social environment, as is the case with a uh, Vaishya. But with the Kshatriya and the Sudra, they are in a way their own creation. They shape themselves, they form themselves in what they want to be, uh, not so much in what they're yeah, uh, ordered to be. Um, and here there's also a very big um, difference, uh, because as I uh, explained earlier, um, the, uh, the difference between the, the Sutra and the Ksatriya is the morality. So what we see is that the in the way in which a Kshatriya person shapes him or herself is basically by using the moral guidelines, using the moral principle. So they often have an ideal, what is the perfect person, what is the perfect behavior, what is perfection. And this is what I try to attain, this is what I want to be. So uh, people with Kshatriya nature, they tend to be very hard on themselves, very strict on themselves, and basically they're willpower is focused inwardly. So they are in a way trying to transform themselves into a perfect being. And if you look at the Sudra nature, uh, these are people who are very practical. 
Um, so they're looking at, okay, what needs to be done? What is required uh, a little bit? So they're in a way a little bit more outward looking uh, than Exatria. And they're also not so restricted in like, okay, this is the only way or this is the only proper way. They're much more um, practical in nature. So they just want to get a certain result. They want to get a certain effect. And what do I need to do to get that effect? So you see it also reflected in the martial arts. You have, for instance, in Japanese martial arts, you have several dos, a karate do, judo, aikido. And this is basically a path which you follow both in yeah, uh, working uh, with your body, but also in working with your energy and with your spirit and with your attitude. And so it's an internal fight which you're fighting, not so much an external fight. And if you look at several other uh, martial arts, especially modern systems, um, they're more like uh, jitsu, like jujitsu uh, or ninjitsu where you learn to create a certain effect which can be to defeat your opponent or to be silent or to not to uh, get harmed so the effects you're trying for are much more outside of yourself than inside of yourself so in a way the, the Ksatriya works inside of themselves while the Sudra works more outside of themselves and this is also uh, very clear in how um, the energetic body works. So um, usually the uh, relative strength or dominance of the bottom three chakras they really indicate a very strong willpower and often what we tend to see is there is a structure in the second chakra which I talked about I think in an early lesson which is called the long will and this is basically a kind of a programming, just like the, uh, the programming, moral programming you can have in the seven chakra. And this is basically uh, self-programming to keep on working on yourself or on a certain ideal for several lifetimes. So this is really a very strong impulse you, where you're saying like, okay, I will do this, I will become the perfect warrior or the most pure person or the most enlightened person and this is a task which usually cannot be completed easily in one lifetime so this long will is actually an impulse which carries over through different incarnations and many Ksatriyas have, have developed this long will have developed this structure in their second chakra so this is a good indication if you see this structure it is not so much an inverted pyramid but more a cylinder shape and the size and the length of the cylinder in a way indicates how strong this long will is and usually when people are in a way just playing around with it for one or two incarnations it is usually about this long it's about you know four to five centimeters so this is the beginning of forming a long will the beginning of a foundation which should last several lifetimes and by the time a person has indeed um, really developed it to quite a high level then it's usually like about 20 centimeters long this structure and around that time you see that the person also loses a lot of freedom over their incarnation because the programming is so strong that they feel this inner drive, this inner impulse to follow their path and they cannot be diverted from their path anymore or very difficult so this creates a kind of a rigidity uh, this rigidity is very typical for people of uh, Xatria nature so the willpower in a person of Sudra nature is much more flexible usually um, also the impulse um, what we uh, tend to see is that people with the with Xatria nature because they are very um, oriented towards higher ideals they tend to blend energies from their their higher chakras into their lower chakras so if you look at the third chakra in a person of exatria nature you will find that the yellow which is typical for the, uh, the third chakra will often have purple or blues in it um, 
because these are basically the ideas or the ideals which the person has and which are in a way then restricting the person's ability to use their power, to use their strength. So they're in a way binding themselves with their own morality so that all their energy gets focused on a very narrow path of self-development but also in interacting with the world. And if you look to a person with a sutra nature you will see that the third chakra usually doesn't contain uh, a lot of blues at all. It may contain some greens from the heart, it may also contain some reds and oranges from those lower chakras, uh, which are impulses and drives to, uh, to work, to manifest themselves, to grow, uh, but the energy is much less focused, much less restricted. Uh, so these are ways in which we can really uh, see in the energetic body, uh, the nature or the, the, the caste system. And um, in a way these castes are inherited, but in another way they are not. Um, so as I said before, um, energy tends to flow from high to low. So if a person with a, with a Brahman nature has intercourse or contact with a person of Sudra nature, the energy will tend to flow away from the person with the Brahman nature to the person of the Sudra nature. And ultimately it can go two ways. If, it's, uh, if in a way the person with the Sudra nature with a low vibration is insatiable, then ultimately the person with high vibration will get exhausted and their energy will come down to the lowest level. And that the energy transfer will stop. It's also possible that the person gets fed and nurtured by this higher energy and will rise up to this higher level. Um, what you see basically in, um, in folklore that in the India there is a very big fear of losing this higher energy. So people try to hoard it, to keep it within the family or within the line. So they in a way the people of the lower caste try to marry up to get these higher impulses into their bloodline and the people of the higher caste they tend to marry only with people of at least an equal caste because they are afraid of losing their uh, uh, their blessings, their powers, their purity. And uh, when you have an intermarriage um, basically the person with the higher caste is seen as having sacrificed themselves and becoming a member of the lower caste. So it tends to be uh, basically a system where they uh, follow the worst case scenario. So they say that the lower energy is the dominant energy and will determine in a way what the person is like, who you're, what you will become like if you're married to them, but also what your children will be like. Um, as I explained in earlier uh, lessons, uh, the bloodline is not the only uh, thing which influences the energy body. We also have the, the, the planet, the place where you're born, uh, the influence of your own spirit, uh, uh, your karmic uh, qualities which allow you to yeah, create an energy body with a higher or lower vibration and limits or increases the possibilities. But you can say in a way statistically that if a person wants to have a Brahman body it is much easier if you're uh, born with two Brahmin parents than with two Sudra parents. So uh, exceptions happen, but statistically you can say that yes, uh, by the, the quality of your parents also the children are at least affected by it, but not determined by it. So it's very important to, to have this distinction that we are affected by our parents, but not necessarily determined by our parents. Um, so, if we look a little bit also at the, um, uh, the roles or the areas in which the people from the different castes work, I will show this middle part here on the video. So, the uh, social role, in a way, for the Brahmana caste uh, is to bring these higher impulses. So their basic role is to be uh, innovators. 
and their, their work field is basically a, a spiritual work field. They work with higher impulses, they work with the path the spirits want to follow in the world and of course we as humanity grow and evolve and all the beings on the earth grow and evolve, also the animals, also the stones, also the plants and so to yeah, continue this path in a way we are creating the path as we go along and the innovation impulses which come to the Brahmana caste they're necessary to bring our society along so we can continue our spiritual uh, growth and uh, the Kshatriya are in a way the persons who work internally they do the most psychological work they're more most focused on self-development and uh, they're in a way the leaders uh, because they go before the rest of us in this process of working on ourselves in self-development and self-perfection so they're in a way who are showing us how to develop ourselves how to grow as spiritual beings and also they um, are in a way the, the culmination of what has happened before of all the lessons of all the phases uh, of spiritual growth what is which were there before, so they're in a way naturally conservative by nature because they're in a way they hold to the essence of all the previous teachings and in a way out of this conservative impulse which holds all the previous teachings and this innovative impulse out of this mixture a new synergy should yeah, come forward uh, to create a new path, a new direction of, uh, of growth, of self-development which can then be shared with the world. So then we come to the uh, Vaishas uh, impulse. So as I said before, the Vaishas impulse is the human impulse. So it is very much about communication, about sharing, about getting people involved, giving people experiences, letting them feel something. Because if there is a person meditating in a cave, he might achieve lots of beautiful things, but nobody's going to know about it. So it is the purpose of the Vaishya to go to this person in the cave and write a book about it, or tell stories about it, or legends about it, and bring these lessons to the people so they can be shared, so they can be um, so that his progress or her progress can become the progress of humanity. Um, so the Vaishyas are essential in carrying impulses uh, throughout humanity, spreading impulses. Um, so they're in a way the ones who weave the web and travel along this web of energies, connecting all cultures, um, connecting all people and sharing all the knowledge and the blessings uh, which are generated. So uh, they can share wealth, they can share technology, um, they can share energies, <clears throat> but they're in a way the great disseminators. Um, in a way you can say the, um, the catalysts. So there is the knowledge, but without the catalyst it doesn't affect the rest of humanity. And this is in a way what is the role of the, of the Vaisha. If you look at the Sudra, they're the creators. So they can feel these impulses which have in a way been translated from this high spiritual impulse to a human impulse by the Vaisha. And the Vaisha can then in a way order or inspire people to manifest it, to create it in the form of physical objects, of indeed works of art, in architecture, um, in books, in exercises. So it is basically the role of the Sutra to make things practical, to make all the knowledge into something you can do. So for instance a person might meditate in a cave and find out that gosh there's this really beautiful state of awareness. Okay, Vaisha might hear about it and tell well this person told me about his experiences and this beautiful state of awareness and the Sutra will say like okay so what does do I need to do to get into this state of awareness? And he will yeah, have exercises or maybe even create rituals together with the Brahman and it will become, it will take form, it will take shape, it will become in a way solid. 
and something which can also be shared more easily and also has a certain stability, a certain uh, uh, pre-calculated effect of it. There becomes it becomes in a way a little bit more mechanical in nature uh, as it falls into the hands of the sudra. And this is basically the uh, when everything is becomes crystallized, and in a way um, the knowledge or the experience becomes into a tradition or in a holy book or in uh, rules of law. So this is basically how it filters down the impulse to the most physical level and also the lowest levels of creation are transformed. So the role of every caste is in a way to transform their level and then the, the once that level is transformed sufficiently then it is picked up by the lower caste who uses it and then the lower caste who uses it and then the lower caste who uses it to transform the level of energy which they are attuned to. So the last thing I wanted to say about this, because time is marching forward, is to really tie in the caste system a little bit with other systems. So I will show a little system here in front of the camera. So on one hand side it has the castes, and on the other side it has the different elements in the Greek system. So in, according to the Greeks the highest element is fire which is in a way also the spiritual impulse, the transformational impulse. So this would coincide with uh, the, the Brahmin caste who bring the fire of the gods to the earth. Uh, the Ksatriya uh, correspond to the air. So the air is the power of, of reason, also the area of the psychology, the philosophy um, but also air is about wisdom and in a way in the essence of wisdom about good rulership, good governance, uh, setting a good example, creating good ideals. Uh, so this is really the area of the, of the Kshatriya. When we come to the Vaisha we come also to the element of water. Water is the community, it is the emotion, it is the experience, it's the sharing, it's also the collective consciousness while the air is usually more about the individual consciousness or um, the consciousness without emotion where it is purely mental and really in the area of the Vaisha it becomes an experience something which is not no longer theoretical but actually becomes transforming so you can read a book about an exercise and that's knowledge, that's air but by experiencing it, by doing it, by making a journey, instead of reading about a journey, it becomes an experience and you are transformed by it. So this is the water element of the Vaisha. And finally we have the earth element of the Sudra, which is the crystallization when it becomes stable, when it becomes not just a transitory experience, gosh I had such a nice experience and you forget all about it, but that you really become a different person by having had this experience, that it is really something which is not just passing but actually becomes a part of you, a part of your structure. And this is the element of the Sudra, the element of Earth. And if we translate it into Kastaneda, you can also look at it as the system of the winds. And also the winds can be seen in the energetic body. So if you look at the cocoon, which is basically the part of the aura which is very close to the physical body, um, we, you see that the, uh, the role of the Brahmana uh, is most similar to the role of the West Wind, who brings this inspiration. And in the energetic body of the West Wind you see that they have a crown. So in a way the cocoon is not closed, it's not rounded around the head, but it is open with jagged points and in a way like channels so that the energy is guided to certain parts of the brain so higher impulses are not blocked from the from the head but are in a way channels into the brain like with antenna on the head so the west wind tends to correspond uh, a lot with the, with the brahmana if you look at it cross-culturally if we look at the, um, the ksatriya um, it would correspond most with the north wind. 
So the north wind structure is uh, both the north and the south wind, they have an open heart structure. So they're in a way the sensitive people, which doesn't correspond totally, but yeah, we have different cultural systems and also different parts of the energy body. But anyway, all the impulses they get, they flow upward to our higher chakras. And the higher chakras are also the parts with which we judge. So we have our cultural judgment system, we have our harmonic judgment system, and we have our spiritual judgment system. And what happens naturally for the Xatra people is that they judge all the time. Like, is something right? Is something good? Is something pure? Is something moral? So this is the fourth complexes, which are natural. So they correspond a little bit with the north wind tendencies. Yeah? And the Vaisha tendencies, they tend to correspond with the south wind. So the south wind have an opening in the cocoon also at the heart. But the energies don't go up like with the north wind, but they go south. So they don't become integrated with the chakras of judgment, but integrated with the judgment with the chakras of action, with willpower. So we feel the other person and we act to connect with them. So we feel their pain and we want to comfort them. We feel their hunger and we want to support them. So it is very much also the role to create harmony, to create brotherhood, uh, which is the, the function of the, of the Vaisha. And uh, finally we have the, the, the east wind. So the east wind is characterized by having a, a larger uh, a cocoon around the lower chakras. So this is really shows that the part of us which has willpower is in a way able to extend that willpower, to project that willpower outward. Uh, so the east winds who are basically the generators of, of structure, who can manifest our will, who can manifest order, uh, they tend to correspond a little bit with the, with the Sudra structure. And if we look at, for instance, male and female qualities, uh, we also see them alternating. Um, because sensitivity is often seen as a feminine quality and willpower is seen as a masculine quality. So you could see that in a way uh, the persons of the Brahmana caste, who are supposed to be very sensitive, and be very um, following the higher will, uh, they tend to have more feminine qualities. And the persons who have a Ksatra nature, who are in a way very tough, very demanding, very strict, uh, they tend to have more masculine qualities. If you look again at the, uh, the Vaishas, they tend to have very feminine qualities, very caring, very sensitive, very emotional. And if we look at the sutras, they tend to be much more uh, masculine again. So they're goal-oriented, uh, practical, get things done. No, don't worry about other things, focus on the task, just do it in the easiest way possible. Like a little bit of hunter's mentality uh, is the sutras mentality. Um, so if we map in a way our caste system onto uh, the male parts of the cocoon, uh, we can also see a match there. Um, so, if you look at the, the, uh, the Brahmana, the Brahmana is most uh, similar to the, to the, man, of action, uh, to the uh, man behind the screens in the Castaneda system, in the Toltec system. So, the man behind the screens is the person who does not actually um, initiate action, but tries to harmonize what is already there. So in a way also to bring this impulse uh, into an existing uh, situation. Um, and the, uh, the typical characteristic for a man of action is basically that they can easily blend their energies. They're a little bit chameleon-like. So their energy can in a way join with the energy of another person. So the energy body is very, um, has a very complex structure in a man of action. And in a way it's, usually the man of action has a lot of control over the energy body. Um, so it can morph into all kinds of different shapes and structures. So it's a very adaptable energy body. And that's basically, also tends to correspond a little bit with the function of the, of the Brahmana caste. If we look at the, uh, the man of action, 
um, in the man of action, you have a person who has one goal, one focus, and in a way gets people to go along with it. So in a way they have a very strong impulse and they're the natural leaders, the, net, the people everybody follows, because they know for certain what is right, what knows to be done, they have no doubts. Um, so the man uh, of action has a very compact energy body, very solid, almost uh, very usually also quite relatively insensitive in, their, uh, in the masculine part of the energy body. Um, so if we look at the, at the Vaishas, they're the typical scout. They are very sensitive people, they are very good at making connections, at going anywhere, at finding the right energies, finding the right groups, finding the right circumstances. And finally we have the scientist, and they correspond to the Sudra. So the people of a Sudra nature, they need to have a practical understanding, a working understanding of whatever comes into their hands, whether it is a physical object or an energetical object. So if you find that you have a certain caste structure, it's also useful to try to use either the, the feminine qualities, which you see in the wind, or the male qualities, which you uh, see in the, in the masculine Toltec system, and try to develop those parts of the energy body, because they help you to carry forward uh, your mission, which you have as member of a certain caste. Um, and also to work with the element, which is natural to your caste. So it is very interesting to see how actually all these different cultures um, they have a different way of approaching it. And if you look at the elements and also the, the cocoon with its winds and the four masculine categories, they show you the nature of the energy body. But the nature of the energy body doesn't give you a purpose. So if you have a lot of fire or air or you're an east wind or west wind or whatever, it's a tool but to what end? And basically the cost structure provides a little bit more of the social integration and also the cooperation between people uh, which you can use. And I've talked very long on this subject, I notice. Um, okay. Um, so that goes a little bit, I answered a little bit of also the, the first question which was uh, the, on the list, which is about choosing your parents. So basically um, a person chooses a role they want to play, so often in a way uh, the cast is decided. Like I want to be a very social person, I want to work on myself, I want to in bring new impulses to the world or I want to have a lot of effect or a lot of power in the world as a sutra. And um, once you have your mission, you start to look for tools. Um, what can help you to do that? So you often look for uh, a situation or a culture or a bloodline which will give you the tools, which can help you to yeah, be successful in your mission. So we choose in a way the time in which we are born, we choose the culture in which we are born, um, we choose the astrological circumstances and also our parents. So they are very much uh, part of the whole package of uh, why we are born. So the parents are not the ultimate or the, the most important thing, but they are very much uh, a very big part of the package. Uh, also because in a way we tend to uh, inherit, in a way, the uh, unused parts of our parent. So, for instance, if I have this great ambition to be a great pianist, but I never had found the time or uh, had the opportunity to learn to play the piano, then this is a part of my energy body, which, in a way, wants to manifest itself. It has a certain power, but it was never allowed to mature, to integrate. And these parts tend to migrate, as I said, like unconscious parts of the energy body, you tend to yeah, push away into other energy bodies, into the children. So whatever I could not do, but really wanted to do, that is often what my children will end up doing or helping me to do. So they tend to manifest or reflect back all these unused or subconscious parts of the self. 
So in a way, the children are therefore also very much a mirror of the, the, the dark side or the unseen side of the parent. And often they also choose to have that role as teachers for their parents or as mirrors for their parents, but also sometimes as helpers for their parents. So the things their parents could never do, could never manifest, they will manifest it for them to fulfill the task or the role or the karma of their parents so that they can leave their life, uh, leave their incarnations in, in peace, having succeeded or having transformed the world enough. So, yeah, we don't choose our parents very lightly. It's often a process which we spend several years to think about. And uh, most people uh, actually choose their mother before they're born. Um, so they tend to hang around with their mother already for many, many years before actually they are, uh, they are born. Um, some spirits also choose the father, but that's not as often. It's also because we tend to inherit more from our mother's line when it comes to energetical qualities. And it is also true that women tend to inherit more of their mother's line, men tend to inherit more of their father's line. So for a boy, a father is more important, and for a daughter, the mother it is in a way more important in the choice as to the, the parent. But once they are in a way incarnated, also the opposite uh, a sex parent tends to be um, more important not so much into what we inherit energetically because we have more a uh, person who's more feminine will connect more to the feminine qualities which are available in family and the person who's more masculine will connect more to the more masculine qualities which are present in the family but in a way the opposite sex parent is like the, the trigger which uh, guides our self-development, which guides our action. Um, so what we often see is in a way that the, the masculine is very stable but also very passive until um, the feminine um, gets it to act, uh, in a way uh, seduces it to, to come into action. Um, and in a way the, the masculine is often in a way, the inspiration for the for for the feminine also to act, so they tend to inspire each other, and in this role, the, the opposite parent is very important, so that in a way the um, the qualities which you inherit um, become activated. So as a boy, I inherit qualities from my father, but my mother should activate these masculine qualities in me. And in the opposite way, if I was a woman, I would inherit feminine qualities from my mother. But my father would need to activate them. So I start using them more. Um, so I will have a quick look at the questions again. Um, So yeah, that's a little bit about the deeper mystical connections. Uh, what you often see is also that people will have also a connection on an egregorial level. Um, so people who are in a way working on the same goal or on the same ideal, they're in a way already in a, in a system of, uh, of brotherhood, of cooperation. So it's very natural for them to, to co-incarnate, to meet up as family members or as friends or as children or parents of each other. Um, so in that way we like the same energies tend to act like magnets so that we yeah um, coalesce uh, naturally uh, I see also that I also did not answer one other question about um, whether nations are inclined to re represent a particular caste. Um, so what we see a little bit is that um, as we progress uh, spiritually, we have to learn to integrate all these four castes in ourselves to become like a superhuman being. Um, but humanity is very, very far from that ideal. So we, it's, for now we have to learn also to just to work as one caste and to cooperate with other castes. 
not to be an entire people within ourselves, although that is an ultimate goal. And we're starting on that path, but right now it would be already great if we could just learn how to be ourselves and to be uh, very productive in uh, a larger social environment. Um, but yes, we do also have um, uh, different purposes as different nations. And this is discussed uh, in length by, the, um, uh, by Rudolf Steiner, but there's also a different system, different theories about uh, why we would take incarnation within a specific culture. And in general, you can say that uh, people with an African culture, they have a very good um, uh, self-awareness. Um, they have a very practical nature, they tend to really feel their emotions. Uh, very deeply, very unrestrictedly, um, and they tend to have a very strong um, sense of connectedness. Uh, they're ver a very sensitive people. Um, if you look at, in a way, the, the, the Native Americans, uh, they tend to have a very strong um, sense of interconnection with uh, with society, with other people. So their individuality or their self-awareness is not so much developed, but their awareness of their environment is very strongly developed. So this is something people could learn in by taking incarnation in those cultures. If we look at Asian cultures, Asian cultures tend to be rather um, conservative in nature. Um, so it is very much about, in a way, uh, wisdom, balance, uh, harmony, um, in a way also self-development, uh, very much the powers of order, uh, of law, of tradition, um, which are, play a very strong role in those cultures. And if we look at Western culture, it's a very um, chaotic impulse, always new inventions, uh, new science, uh, incredible amount of warfare unparalleled by any other continent. Uh, so this whole idea of, of revolution, of chaos, is very much what is in the essence of, uh, of European uh, birds. And if we look more specifically into Europe, um, Steiner also created a kind of a, um, a ladder, if you could say, in awareness. So all the way in the West, we, uh, we see the very highly individualized, almost static British culture where it has become very capitalistic. Uh, think of number one, think about yourself and identify with your caste and your position and try to do the best you can as an individual. And when we see it a little bit more towards uh, France and Germany, uh, we get an idealistic aspect. So it's not just the individual, but the individual has a social role to play. Um, we are all brothers and sisters and cooperating and having stewardship of the earth and a duty towards each other. So it becomes um, already a little bit more social. And in Eastern Europe, we have the, the, the more mystical aspect where really it becomes about um, joining um, with uh, uh, higher powers, a connection uh, from the heart, experiencing energies, experiencing each other on a more emotional level or, or even on a more spiritual or energetic level. Um, so there's also that kind of stratification within the European culture, which is in itself, as I said, uh, a culture of chaos, of renewal, of in a way you could say the, the fire element, uh, if you would look at it in, the, in that way. And the oriental element uh, you could um, characterize a little bit as, um, you could say, the, the, the element of, uh, of air, um, which is very much about uh, structure. And, and knowledge and you could in a way characterize the the, the, uh, the African continent a little bit as the element of water it is all about uh, passion emotion experience but also 
about society, about connecting with each other. While the uh, Native American culture could be uh, signified as a culture of earth, um, where there is a, a harmony, a system, almost a mechanical system of coexistence, which is very fragile, but also very exact and very static in a way in nature. Um, so I'll move on to the last question, of, about which I could talk actually for another hour. Um, and I think actually I will save the last question for, uh, for next week, because I could easily talk for a lot of time about that one. I will just tell you what it is. Uh, do runas and other symbolic signs live in their, their own life, in their own world, or are they present and can be read only if there's also a human who does it? Respectively, does the world of science work independently from humans who give meanings to the science and the things and events? So the small teaser answer would be uh, just to say that yes, these symbols have a life of their own, but I'll go into that in detail uh, next week. But I would like to see if there are any more questions about the topics I talked about uh, today. Um, so if anybody has a question or... Yes? Um, yes. So often the, 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 the question is uh, children can bring parents together but can they also separate parents? And the short answer is yes. And usually what you, um, what you see is in a way that often children, the spirit of children has a feeling of, of brotherhood um, to the parents. So they tend to um, want to help the parents. And if it is better for the parents to stay together, they will try to help them to stay together. If it is better for the parents to separate, they will try to get the parents to separate. And also it can be very much part of their own karma. Um, so for instance, if I look at, at my own life, my uh, father uh, lost his father who was murdered when he was the age of six. And in my life, when I was six, my parents got divorced. So there can also be a very yeah, karmic process in a way uh, of repeating certain traumas which your parents have incurred so they get another chance at, at working on them. And in a way also it can be that I carry this, uh, uh, this burden, this karma, which my father may not have completely processed, that I take it on to me to work with it, to, to, to process it by losing in a way my own father. Uh, so I try to resolve it for him. Um, so these are, are methods in which the, the, the children and the parents can interact. And um, what you often see is that, that in a way the, the children are often also the, the, the translators, the manifestors for the hidden impulses in the parents. So very much like, um, like animals do. Um, so, for instance, when I was living together with my previous girlfriend, we had two cats. A male cat, which identified with me, and a female cat, which identified with my girlfriend. And when, yeah, we had some disharmonious feelings towards each other, um, the two cats would also start fighting with each other. And usually when we saw that the cats were fighting, we knew that we had stuff we had to resolve, we had to talk about, we had to, to work on within our relationship. So they very much manifested our tensions. And this is also something children do naturally. Because, as I said before, we tend to push the things we don't want away and we naturally push it into our children. So our children are very much the mirrors of the things we don't deal with. And um, if 
there is too much things we don't deal with, then the parent starts to dominate in a way the, the development and the experience of the child rather than their own spirit because the parent can have a very strong influence on the child. Uh, so as parents we should really um, try to take responsibility for our own thoughts and feelings instead of letting our child carry too much. So they are there to help but also they shouldn't get physically or emotionally sick or damaged. And it's the same with having cats or dogs or other animals around. Uh, they willingly carry our burden, but it's also our responsibility to, yeah, to help them, to protect them, and not to overburden them too much. Um, so often also we will uh, attract children who are in a way um, either uh, uh, the same as we are or the total opposite of what we are. And this is in a way to create good mirrors. So if they are the same, you can identify with the child and live together with the child. And if the child is an opposite, it tends to be uh, a contrast. Or at least we tend to perceive them in that way. And uh, both things make it very difficult for a parent to treat the child as like a separate individual. Because you tend to see them either as yourself, because you see the similarity, or you see them as, in a way, uh, the enemy or everything which is problematic or bad because they're, in a way, reflecting your prejudice. Um, and the, to what degree you either identify with or see them as opposite also um, shows how much you can allow them their own individuality, their own life as a, as a separate person. So these are things which you need to take into account as a parent when, uh, when raising children. And just like animals who take on traits of their owners, also children tend to take on traits of their parents or who other people who are around them, friends, teachers. Um, and some traits will stick and they will become integrated in their personality and other traits won't. And basically the sensitive period for, um, yeah, Picking up personality traits um, goes on until the, the, the late 20s. So until that time, in a way, the, the friends, the teachers, but also the parents play a very important role in the development of a child. But basically in their 30s, the child will be a separate individual who can no longer be you know, molded or influenced by the parent that much. So in a way also the role of parenting ends usually in the late uh, 20s. Okay, um, I hope that answers your question uh, a bit. Um, are there any more questions or remarks? Uh, so, I will just repeat the question for the recording. So, um, the question is, uh, is there an evolution to the caste system? Or should we accept it more or less as a, as a given and where did it come from? Uh, the caste system basically has, um, has two sources. So, it has, uh, as one source, uh, the, the phrases I used are basically taken from the Vedic culture, which is the uh, uh, culture of the Indian subcontinent and Central Asia uh, but also we developed it separately here in Western Europe and I will use in a way the system in Western Europe as a um, as a guideline so we had the church and the clergy which 
correspond to the Brahmana caste. And we had the nobles and the knights and the warriors, which basically correspond to the uh, Kshatriya caste. And then, in a way, there were the normal people, the peasants, who correspond to the Sudra caste. And um, this was basically largely medieval society. And um, as society progressed, we got a fourth caste, which was basically uh, the citizen, the, the burghers who lived in the cities, and the merchants who lived by trade. So they're, in a way, uh, and the artists who worked for, um, yeah, who brought uh, poems and the bards who traveled around. So this was, in a way, the emergence of the, of the Vaisha uh, caste. And if we look also into the evolution of power, we see that the earliest societies were basically matriarchal societies, which were ruled by women and were ruled also by the Brahmana caste. So everybody experienced the higher worlds, people were very sensitive to these higher vibrations. So the feminine was seen as the, of course, the the best link to these to the divine so priestesses were seen as the as the leaders the natural leaders of, of humanity of humankind so we had the leadership by by brahmans in the first instance and basically as um, society progressed and uh, we learned how to make uh, weapons of different metals we learned how to organize ourselves into larger groups and to store food uh, then war became the, the essence. Uh, so who were the leaders? The persons who could beat other people up. It became basically a much more violent society where basically uh, strength of the physical body and skill at arms and uh, yeah, uh, uh, the ability to make force others to do your will became the dominant power. So we, uh, in a way, devolved, you could say, from uh, a Brahmin society, which was matrilineal, into a patriarchal uh, society, which was basically Kshatriya, warrior-based. And if we look at basically medieval uh, society, it was ruled by kings, it was ruled by nobles, it was ruled by knights, who basically ruled by, yeah, because of their, their, their qualities, by their strengths, which was superior to those of other people. But we've actually moved on from that, uh, or down from that, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, because now you can be the world's greatest um, scientist or martial artist, but ultimately you're working for somebody who's your boss, who gives you your job. And it's basically the Vaisha caste, the, the money which is now actually ruling or which has become the dominant power. So we've gone from in a way, sensitivity being the quality which was the highest quality in the world. We moved to strength and discipline and now we move to in a way uh, adaptability, uh, social skills which is again a little bit more uh, moving towards the feminine because women are better uh, as being practical, at being uh, creating a nice atmosphere um, and um, it is very odd in a way, I find that um, we're still in a way hanging on to this uh, patriarchal male dominated society. While if you look at actually the qualities and the skills which are valued, they're feminine qualities. And uh, you see also, for instance, in, in Japan, uh, the, the Vaisha caste used to be. Uh, completely dominated by women. Women were the merchants, were the traders, um, were the persons who created the cooperation and the harmony between different factions. And it is only now that through American influence and other things that it's starting to water down and you see men also entering into business. But I do think that business should be actually the uh, ruled much more by feminine qualities rather than masculine qualities because masculine qualities are basically much more adversarial and if you look at our current economic system it is about competition 
It is about who can defeat the opponent, who can kill the opponent, who can make more money, who can trick the other person, who can steal the client from the other person. So this is a very masculine type of, 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 of Vaisha society. If we had a more feminine quality Vaisha society, it would be much more about cooperation, about sharing. And I think this, this would be the natural next step in, uh, in human evolution, that we go into a Vaisha society which is not so masculine but much more feminine. And ultimately we would go into a, a, a Sudra society. Um, and basically where every person becomes a, uh, a creator in and of by themselves. So that we become, um, in a way, completely uh, individualized, uh, self-sufficient. Uh, that we can integrate, in a way, all these qualities which we had learned by being governed by Brahmin, by being governed by Xatras, by being governed by Vaishas and ultimately that we become free individuals in the Sutra society. Um, so according to, uh, to the works of Steiner, that should happen in about 1500 years that we would move into such a society. So it's a slow process of, uh, of integrating these different castes and ultimately also the shifting of power uh, between these different castes. And the, the danger is in a way that every time we move to a lower caste, that we also lose the qualities of the higher caste. So what we see a little bit as, as we moved from a, a Brahmanic society to a Kshatriya ruled society, um, is that laws become very uh, strict, very draconic, um, and uh, society becomes very um, conservative, very adversarial. So people tend to, in a way, become crystallized in their culture, in their beliefs. Um, and that is basically because when we moved into this Kshatriya society, we didn't integrate enough these innovative aspects, these uh, inspirational impulses of the, um, of the Brahmana caste, which ruled us for thousands of years before. And now as we move into the Vaishya-dominated society, we should, we should incorporate the qualities of the Kshatriya caste, which is basically a morality um, that we try to do good, that we try to improve ourselves, um, that we try to create a good and healthy society. Um, and if we go into a Vaishya society without these Kshatriya qualities, uh, then we become, in a way, uh, a rudderless because Xatria has a very clear goal in mind, they have an ideal, they have a perfect world in mind which they try to create. And if we don't have that, then we are not going to create a better world, we're just going to run after the money and without any look to the future, without any plan to the future. And that's what we see our government doing a little bit now. They have no vision because they have not integrated the Xatria qualities into their Vaisha natures. And uh, so this is very much the, uh, the system we're in. We have to develop our Vaishya natures because those are the dominant traits of our time to, be, to manifest ourselves and to grow in our society or we have to at least cooperate with people who have st a strong Vaishya nature. But we must not forget to, in a way, integrate the Brahman qualities into the Kshatriya and the Kshatriya qualities into the Vaishya and ultimately as a Sudra who's very practical oriented, who just wants to get things done, he should not forget to incorporate the Vaishya nature, which is basically the awareness of being part of a greater whole, of a greater system, of being in, in a network of friends, of being in a, uh, in a global culture and also in a multidimensional culture, connected with other solar systems and other beings, so that when we ultimately become that individual, we don't become a separated individual, but we, we become an integrated individual. And in our current time, uh, we see that, that people are starting to get a little bit mixed energy bodies. 
So uh, people will generally have a main trait, so their energy body will have a Kshatriya or Brahmana or Vaishnava, uh, Vaisha or Sudra nature, but they will also have start having some of the energy qualities of qualities in the energetic body of their other um, traits. But because some traits are mutually exclusive, like sensitivity and willpower, certain things don't combine very well. But um, it's also not necessary for us to, um, to have all traits as long as we understand them and can work with them. So I don't, for instance, as a Brahmana, I don't need to have a lot of uh, willpower or practical skill or social skill as long as I un have an understanding uh, and I can recognize it in other people and I can cooperate with them. So this is more the, the goal of the integration, not necessarily to immediately turn yourself into a superhuman, but at least to harmonize your role with all the other roles. And ultimately, then when you start to integrate these other roles into your own being, then it can go seamlessly. Because um, if you don't harmonize that, in a way your innovative part will fight with your conservative part. And these idealistical parts will fight with your practical parts and your, your social part, your heart for others, will fight with your needs to, to make money and to take care of yourself because they are not completely integrated. So in a way we have a process of external integration uh, which is happening in, outside in society and we need to translate that into internal in integration. So in a way the condition of our society, this you know, a struggle between the different castes and different roles, is a reflection of our inner struggle, of our inner uh, immaturity. And so we should in a way strive for cooperation between all these powers, both outside and inside. Um, and also, yeah, in a way also it's good to, to if you have a lot of feminine qualities, to focus on developing your Brahmanic and Vaishya side, and if you have a lot of masculine energies, to try to shape them into Kshatriya and Sutra qualities. I hope that answers your question. Oh yeah, this is a big question. Uh, with regards to, um, to children, what if a woman feels she really wants to have a child, but it never happens? Relationships fail, guys never want to have a child, etc. Why is this? Is this that she is haunted by a soul that wants to reincarnate, but is not part of her life plan? Uh, yes, it's a very big thing. So there is um, basically two impulses which can coincide um, because men in general they have a very um, strong tendency to, to copulate with women uh, but they don't have a tendency to, to generate children per se because for them yeah in a way the copulating with women uh, tends to result in children so they don't, uh, they can't really regulate whether out of a sexual intercourse a child will be born or not. Um, with women, it is usually in their mid twenties or early to mid twenties that a, a hormonal change takes place. And basically, if they have not had a child in their teens, then uh, they start to create certain hormones, which create the urge to to have a child. Um, so it is very much a biological mechanism which women have and men don't. And uh, on, also on a hormonal level, not all women have this equally strong. Um, the interesting thing is basically if you want to look at it from an energetic perspective, um, you find that also before this age, so it usually triggers sometime between 21 and 24 on a hormonal level. 
and people who really have a kind of a destiny to have a child or the spirit is already there who wants to be born will already feel it before that so often already as a teenager they will have a very strong desire uh, to have a child and fantasies about a child and they will be preparing to be a mother uh, so this is one way to, to distinguish. Um, another way to do it is basically uh, to look at the aura. Because just like, um, as I said, like an aura can be infected by spirits which hang around or leech of energy, but also by positive spirit guides and spirit helpers. Also the, the spirit of the child is often present in the aura of the mother and will uh, will try to help them or to guide them um, and um, it's it's a bit of a of a process so ultimately uh, the child wishes to be born but it also has envisioned a certain circumstance so they don't just want to be born with the mother but they often want a very specific type of father or to be born in a specific country or in a specific time and um, if the conditions are not right then the, the spirit can just wait or can even leave so it is possible for in a way uh, a spirit to follow a parent around for like 10 years and then go like okay no nah, it's not really what i wanted i will wait for a better opportunity and it can try to incarnate with you as a parent in in a next life or can try to look for another parent um, but generally if the, the child is there it will try to guide you towards a certain situation to move into another country or to move into a certain relationship and um, this can be very confusing and very traumatizing even for the parent because what the child wants is not necessarily what the mother wants so it might be that the child wants that the mother is deserted by uh, the father so she grows up or he grows up with only a mother without the father but this can be a very difficult situation for for the mother of course um, but these can be um, yeah, in a way conflicting desires uh, between uh, mother and child or father and child even um, but what you see is that, that, that in general, because uh, once you go into a body, it is a very big commitment. You get The spirit gets tied to the body and cannot leave again. So if there's any ri risk or uncertainty that the child tends to wait and prefers to wait in, usually into the next incarnation because they have a lot of patience. It's much more frustrating to have an incarnation which fails and then to be trapped in a situation you can't escape out of than to have to wait because there is a lot of patience in, uh, in spirits they don't care if they have to wait a hundred or a thousand years for an incarnation um, another thing is also um, how much the, the, the parent is open for the influence of the, of the, of the, of the child, of the guidance so if the parent has a very strong personality, a very strong will or very low sensitivity then it can be that it's very hard for the child to guide their parent to the right situation to be born and it can also be that um, just the power of the parent and the child is not enough to, uh, to create a strong enough magnet because in a way you have to um, create something on an energetic level which will then shape the physical world so that it manifests or you get pulled into the correct situation and if for instance the parent doesn't fantasize in the right way or enough about the relationship or the, the situation then it stays too vague it's a little like vague desire less yeah i wouldn't mind having children and if also the child doesn't have enough focus of what it wants then it's very hard to create that situation so it requires a certain translation into an astral reality where there is the child and the parent and the family and it all comes together for it to, to happen in a physical sense, in a physical world and if yeah, there's not enough focus or not enough power, not enough energy or too much distractions 
or too much ego. Um, all these things can foil up the, the plan of the spirit. So it is a difficult and a delicate process um, to arrange this whole, uh, this whole birthing process. Um, and it's often also very confusing uh, because the spirit's desires and the, the ego's desires, they tend not to cooperate very well. Um, often people have a very um, um, big misconceptions about pregnancy, about raising children, um, then uh, from the reality. And often this also creates a kind of an obstacle. Uh, because, for instance, if uh, the child wants to be born as a very difficult child, an enfant terrible who always gets into mischief and always has fights with the parents and goes on drugs and whatever, and the ego of the parent is creating this beautiful angelic child who's talented and obedient and whatever, then, in a way, the child's the child's desire to be born, its own reality has to fight with the reality the ego is projecting in the parent. And then also by having too much desires for your child or for a, a family or picturing a family too strongly from the ego instead of guided and inspired by the child, uh, it can block the birth of the child and can block the right situations for the child to be born. So it's very important if you feel that there is a spirit of a child with you that you allow the, the, guide, the spirit of the child to guide you emotionally, energetically to find the right mate, the right conditions um, for that to take place. And if it's too much ego, then you end up blocking it. So the, the, the question is, um, can a difficult child also be a decision of the parent that they need that as a, as a teacher? Yes. Um, the answer is, uh, is yes. Um, and in a way it is a very positive sign because from the perspective of the ego, nobody picks 